Hey guys, and welcome back to another Unfiltered Gamer board game review. In today's game, up on the tabletop is Monster Hunter World, the board game Wildspire Waste by Steamforge Game and Capcom. This is a one to four player board game that involves players playing as monster hunters and competing uh, with each other, I should say, to basically defeat monsters. Uh, in this base game, it's gonna come with four unique monster miniatures and a wide variety of monsters that coincide with these specific ones here. And you are going to be placing your characters on a board along with a monster, and it's an arena fighting game. You're gonna be moving your characters around, utilizing your stamina cards to defeat the monster. And the monster at the same time is gonna trying to defeat you. All while you'll have this time deck, which if it empties, the game will end and you will run out of time in order to defeat the monster. Beat the monster before the time runs out or before too many characters get down and you will win the game. Will you defeat the monster in Monster Hunter Worlds and progress to the next monster in this campaign slash scenario style game? Let's talk about how to set the game up, a basic idea of how to play, and of course, my review. To set up the game Monster Hunter Worlds, the first thing you do is have each player select a champion they'd like to fight with. Like for instance, here I have the Insect Glaive, and this is the character I will be setting up, and each other player will select one of theirs, and you'll choose a monster. And in this case, we're doing the Barath. This is the first monster that you can fight. However, after you fight this monster, you can choose to fight it multiple times or move on to the next one. And each monster gets more progressively difficult with each time that you fight it, as with, as with each new monster that you come across in the game. But you'll play the basic introductory quest first, and this will be the monster you'll be choosing to fight. Uh, each character is also going to be getting a certain number of cards. Uh, the booklet describes each card in number based on the number on the bottom right hand corner of the card, as well as each of the decks you'll be utilizing. To start with, a, your character might have a unique special card, like a special rules card, like my Insect Glaive has this unique Insect Glaive card here. It'll have a number of armor and a weapon. Uh, in this case here, I've got a chain mail headgear, chain mail vest, chain mail trousers, and an iron blade for my Insect Glaive. I'll get the three unique Insect Glaive cards, my stamina deck cards, which I'll use for attacking, and my attack deck cards, which will be told to me um, how many cards I get based on my character, as well as you're going to get an HP tracker, which will always start at eight, that's how much health you have, and as well as a threat token, which will either be five, six, seven, or eight, or four, five, six, and seven, uh, which will determine where the monster is going to be headed towards based on your location on the map. Uh, from there, you're also then going to take a look at the quest booklet to determine where and how to place everything down on your board. Luckily, the setup for the game is pretty simple. You'll place the monster in its given location, as well as the characters will be in their own given locations. Maybe they'll all start on spaces adjacent to each other. And from there, everybody should have their board set up, the main game board set up, and then the last thing is the monster. Based on the monster that you're fighting and its difficulty will determine what card you use. And there are a variety of cards in the game uh, that reference each of the different monsters. And there's actually quite a few of them. While there's only four miniatures, each monster kind of has its own unique settings for the difficulty ramping up. So you can go ahead and select one of these monsters here. And the symbol references the monster and its HP and all that kind of stuff. So you'll select the bear off and you will then proceed to add all the requirements to it. You'll go ahead and give it an HP tracker, this little standing um, cardboard standee here, and uh, set it to its HP total. Then you're gonna go ahead and put all the armor tokens on its armor breakpoints, as well as you're gonna have its, uh, its own monster deck. There's kind of a behavior deck that goes with the monster with 10 cards here, as well as three cards that might be added to the behavior deck based on how you do it at the very beginning of the phase of the game. Shuffle up the deck, set aside the behavior cards, and last but not least is the time deck. This deck is gonna have a number of cards based on the monster, and in this case, the four Black Diablos, uh, Diabolos, you're gonna actually set up 40 cards, but it's gonna be different per monster. Some monsters will have less, some monsters will have more. Make sure that when you set these cards up, the blue ones are the ones that are, are in the deck here and shuffled, whereas anyone with a red symbol on the bottom, those cards are actually gonna be set aside, which we'll be utilizing later in the game. Once you've got your time deck, your monster set up, and your character set up, as well as the basic idea of the board, which is gonna be just characters, your monster, and any spaces that might contain unique things like water and rocks, et cetera, et cetera, Everything else really can be set aside. Really, you can set aside some tokens and the dice that you might need throughout the game, but everything else, all the other monsters, all the other decks of cards, you won't be utilizing any of these things for this specific scenario. First thing now that you do is you take all your track markers, 
and shuffle them up and place them all face down among all the players so that they can be within reach of them. And you'll begin playing the game. Uh, there are two phases of the game. One is kind of like the exploration slash tracking of the monster phase. And the next phase is fighting the monster. All right, let's talk about it. Okay, so let's track a monster in Monster Hunter Worlds. And I've selected Black Di Diabolos to talk about how this works. Basically, I set the game board up based on the requirements of this specific one. And there are multiple different scenarios and difficulties with this monster here as well. I just picked a random one. I kind of just set the board up just so you get an idea of what it looks like. It might not actually be according to this book here, but it will tell you how many time cards will be in your time deck. It'll also tell you uh, the scout fly level, which will determine what cards go into the monster's deck and what you're able to do during the kind of investigation, as well as your assigned starting point, which will be indicated on the board as well. You'll turn the page, and this is kind of like a choose your own adventure aspect of the game. You'll flip the first page over, and you'll start on one, and you will read it. Di Diabolos is one of the most terrifying foes you can conceive. Fast, strong, enormous in size, and now you're gonna fight it. A creature with all of the cunning and savagery of its kin, blah, 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 blah. You read through the thing, and then you ready yourself for the hunt. Each player will gain an ancient bone, a track token, and progress to uh, entry 20. Or if you don't want to ready for the hunt, you can instead see an open tunnel and perhaps see where it, what it leads you or race to where your prey was last seen. And you can actually go ahead and select one of these and move to the next entry. Speaking of entries and how to basically record them, you'll actually have one of these marker, this, this, this board here, which will indicate your um, player as well as your team, the campaign, and all the items you'll accrue on your, on your player board. So players are actually gonna use one of these uh, sheets in order to indicate things they gain throughout each of the different missions here. So you'll write all your information down and as you progress uh, thoroughly through this book here, you'll add things like monster bones and ancient bones and wyvern gems, etc., etc. And you'll progress from one space to the next. And as you do so, basically, you'll gain a number of items. You will be discarding and playing these time cards here. And you'll be adding time cards to your deck. The time cards you get added are randomly shuffled based on the red ones here. So these red ones kind of get shuffled and will get added to your deck, which you'll shuffle at the end of this phase here. And kind of change the way in which the monster is going to behave or in which the game is going to behave as you fight the monster uh, as you take your turns. Now you get a number of these cards here, but as you choose to basically spend time tracking the monster as opposed to fighting it, it will cost you based on these time cards that you have here. Remember, your time cards are what determines how many turns each player is going to get in the game before the monster flees or the timer basically runs out or it enrages and kills you, whatever you want to, however you want to uh, justify it. If the time deck runs out, the game is over and you lose. So navigating how many cards you want to spend based on your choices during this investigation will determine how much time you have and what things you gain. Spend more time doing this, gain more things, but potentially lose out on possibly killing the monster. And once you've finished the campaign and explored all the different scenarios and options, you're going to go ahead and check the back, which will tell you if you finish the adventure with equal to or fewer track symbols, then you'll add this to the deck, uh, the monster behavior deck. If not, if it's in the middle, you'll add this one and you'll add this one, et cetera, et cetera. And the scout fly level determines the number of tracks. So for instance, if I had to pull out one, two, three, four tracks, while going through this kind of choose your own adventure phase, I'll flip all these over at the end and I'll add the total up. And the total up here is one, two, three, four, and five. Okay, five, my assigned scout fly level is two to five, which means that I am in the two to five level. I'm in the middle, which means I'll add the horn thrust behavior card to my behavior deck for the monster and I'll shuffle the deck afterwards. Each of the monsters has three unique behavior cards that will make the monster fight and function differently during the battle phase. Once I have assigned my scout fly level and went through the campaign portion of it or like the choose your adventure portion of the game and added a new behavior card to the deck, then I'm ready to begin. And what's likely to happen is these time cards are going to be discarded as well as one might be flipped over and it will allow you to draw five cards to your hand. So every player is going to start with five cards in their hand at the beginning of the next phase, which is the battle phase, which we'll go ahead and cover now. Okay, so we selected a quest. We went through the gathering phase. It's the exploration slash investigation phase. It's called the gathering phase where you read through the quest book and you determine your scout fly level and what you add. Now we're in the hunting phase. And I have this little cheat sheet in the back of the rule book, which is actually pretty nice. It explains everything. And the monsters will take their turn. 
the hunters will take their turn, and you will continue until the monster is either slain or the hunters fail to complete the quest. How a monster takes their turn? Well, basically, monsters are pretty simple. They'll draw a card from their behavior deck, and they will complete their turn by basically doing what it says. And each of the monster behaviors are unique. This is a tail sweep right. And you'll also notice on the back of the monster card, it will explain how the monster is going to kind of attack and what portion of the monster will attack, but not where it's going to move, who it's going to target, or anything like that. It's when you flip it over, it's where it's determined. Okay, this is a wide sweep attack that hits the back and the back right. It's going to have a range of two. It's going to have a movement of two to the front. It'll be targeting the player with the closest threat, uh, which would be this guy here. And so basically, the monster is going to move one and two. And then it's going to do damage uh, in the back three portions and the right three portions. So it'll hit like um, kind of like an L shape on the monster. And it'll ignore the other three spaces in its front left hand corner area. Uh, additionally, you can check to see how much damage the card does, what cards you need in order to dodge it. So this is a five dodge, two range. It can stun if it hits you. It hits the bottom right side. Um, how many turns players are going to get after this monster takes its action and how many cards can be played for that turn. So in this case here, only one player will take a turn after this card has been played and that player can play up to three cards on their player board. And then you'll go ahead and just discard this card into the behavior discard pile. And from there, the hunters will now take their turn. And I am playing as the Insect Glaive. Now the Insect Glaive has special rules and I'll cover these for, why not, why not right? The Insect Glaive has three Insect Glaive cards. These are called um, Kinsect Harvest Extract cards. And there are three types. There's white, orange, and red. You'll shuffle these cards up. And then for the, the Insect Glaive, specifically you'll place these three face down in a row uh, in front or on top of the player board. At the beginning of every turn, you'll flip over one of these and it will give you a bonus to unique taka types from your deck here. So if your deck has a unique symbol in it, you will be able to do bonus attacks. And at the beginning of your next turn, you flip over the next one, the beginning of your next turn, you flip over that one. And when at the end of a turn, if all three are flipped face up, you'll take them, you'll shuffle them up, and then you will place them face down once again so that you're going to have new, um, your, your attacks can be less powerful and you don't know which one's going to be a t uh, being affected more until the next turn. On your turn, okay, so what can you do? Well, you can move once, which means you can move one singular node if you have the insect glaive and you can, you can move one singular node and you can move uh, up, down, left, or right, or diagonal. You just go ahead and move one space. And then from there, you can play cards. In general, you can pretty much play any cards that you'd like on your board. However, there's a limit to the number of cards and you can play up to five cards on your game board. When you play them, you'll play them face up on your game board and you'll notice that there is a line, a yellow line that goes through all of your cards. Through the yellow line, it'll explain the distance you need to be. It'll explain how many damage cards are drawn. And um, of course, the monster card will relay how many cards you can play. Some other cards might be like this one, where you can discard this card to move your Hunter 1 node, which will let you just simply discard it into a discard pile as opposed to your board, so that you can draw a new, uh, oh, not new, draw a new card. You can actually move your Hunter an extra space if you want, and it won't cover up a space on your board. Your board is basically like your stamina. It's how much effort or energy you can put into a fight at any given turn. And like I said, I can play up to three cards on my game board this turn, so if I want, I can play my Jump Advancing Slash, my rising slash combo, and I can do a wide sweep. And I can place these down because they all have a yellow line. Some cards in your deck, however, are actually gonna be an end attack, which means it's the last card that you can play on your game board. Like a descending slash, it has a red marker and it ends the yellow line, symbolizing the last card to be played. So you can't play that card or you shouldn't play that card as a first card, because then you're going to lose out on playing any other cards until that card is discarded. And then you'll enact each of the cards that you play. I could play up to three, I played three. Each of them will let me draw cards. So I'll be assigning damage to certain portions of the monster. And then I'll add the value of the damage from my damage deck per card. Jumping slash lets me do two cards. Two cards equals two damage here. The next one is a rising combo, one more damage, and then a wide sweep is two damage. Your damage deck is weak to begin with, but can be improved uh, throughout missions and combat experience. And then based on the armor of the different monsters, uh, you'll be removing uh, their HP, the HP of the monsters. Starts with, this one starts with 80, 
and he has a number of breaks that you'll be able to do. Certain cards will let you actually break armor, and when you do, you'll select the basic monster part. You'll ignore, uh, you'll be able to, if you, if you do the damage, you can actually also break pieces here. And breaking pieces off of, off of that monster will give unique benefits, like the body part now has one less defense when this monster portion is broken, or behaviors now have minus one to your, its movement, or uh, remove a tusk card of your choice from the behavior deck and then shuffle the deck getting rid of certain behaviors to make it a little easier on the hunters. Once you've played any cards you'd like up to the number you can play based on the behavior card, then you'll end your turn. And when you do that, you'll draw a time card. Now remember, after you go through the gathering phase, a number of these time cards will be discarded, will be basically removed, as well as a number of these red cards will be added to the deck. So there's gonna be a limited number of these cards on players' turns to be able to basically draw at the end. You'll take this card, you will look at it, and you will read it. This card is going to tell you what the card says, like Threat Shift. Flip the Hunter token face down, discard an attack card from your rightmost side of the game board. That's how you remove attack cards from your game board, thus allowing you to play more cards later, because if it's filled, you're basically unable to do anything. Discard a number of attack cards from your hand, and then draw up to five. Additionally, there's also a unique effect. That's kind of like what almost always happens. All players pass their hunter token to the player to their left, thusly changing the threat, thusly the monster's gonna be fighting the player. Uh, if there's a tie based on the monster and the player's positioning, it'll fight the person with the highest threat. Uh, and then also the facing of the hunter token is each uh, player now has should match the facing of their previous token. So this in, in this case here, this card just says, each player moves their threat, so the monster is now going to have another threat, uh, new threat target, if and so they have the same spaces of movement to another player. So, as an example, I'll just discard that card because that's what would actually happen. If these guys were all the way in the corner here and it was the closest player, uh, these two are exactly the same spaces. One, two, three, one, two, three. And so because of that, uh, the monster is going to select the player with the most threat. So if I have the five token, and this player here has the seven, the monster will enact its behavior to the player with the higher threat total. Once the time card has been played, discarded, and you basically reset your board to an extent, then the next monster behavior card is drawn. Tail sweep to the left as opposed to the right. In which case, it'll do its thing. It'll choose a player that is the closest. It'll move up to two spaces, one and two. It'll always face that player. So the monsters are always going to turn and face the player it's choosing to fight. Uh, and then it's going to do its attack. It's going to do a sweep, right? And the sweep is going to hit this player over here. And it's going to attempt to do a number of damage. Can the player dodge? The dodge requirement is five. If that was me, I'll check the cards in my hand. So if I have cards in my hand, I can actually discard cards in my hand with dodge on them. In this case here, there's a two, a one, and a two and the dodge for this monster is five, so I can discard all three of these cards to ignore the damage. I'm able to basically jump away out of the attack. But it'll be three less cards out of my hand of four that I can now play on my next turn. However, if I didn't have the required dodge, I'll actually just take the damage. And in this case here, it looks like it's going to be, uh, this one here is like nine. It's really high. But basically you'll take the damage uh, minus any defense that you might have or any other abilities that you might have and you'll subtract the damage from your eight to whatever it is you're going to be. And then you're going to end the behavior. You'll check the monster. It says that one more player can take a turn and that that player will get three actions. And remember, whenever you've taken your turn, you are no longer going to be able to take the next turn. Each player has to be able to take a turn first. Um, for each of the rounds before a new player can take a turn. Uh, but in this case, there's only one, so you can actually just choose a player to go. And in which case, they would select to uh, play their cards on their stamina board, take their actions, and try and fight the monster. And it's just gonna rinse and repeat like that. Each monster presents its own unique challenges, its own unique special effects, like the Delving Wyvern, whenever you determine Black Diablos' target for an attack, remove him from the board, place him on the same node as its target uh, without changing its face, move any hunters on that node as if he had moved onto a space, because whenever a, a character moves onto a, a player, that player can basically jump out of the way. Um, and then the resolve of the behavior is normal. So he actually kind of flies around the game board and pushes players off whenever doing their attacks with certain unique behaviors. 
And uh, so each character functions differently and each monster functions differently. Uh, there's a place on each of the players, on each of the monsters boards for different effects and statuses they might get, removing their uh, armor from the monsters portions. You're basically like hacking off armor on the foot or on the back or on the tail and thusly gaining benefits from that. And also whether or not the monster is immune to any effects. And you continue the game. You keep playing, going back and forth until one of two things happens. Either the, um, there are three uh, players who are wiped out that will end the game or if the deck runs out, that will end the game and the players will lose. Or if you slay the monster. And in this case, for Black Diablos, it would be 80 health. If you can remove 80 health from Black Diablos, you will win the game. And then you can progress again. And the game allows you to kind of continue the hunt. You can play against Black Diablos again, but when you do, you're, Diabolos, you can actually select a harder difficulty, increasing the more challenging concepts of the monster. You may only fight a singular monster three times before you have to move on. You can only ever do the introductory quest one time for each time you fight the monster. And things will stack. So you're going to gain benefits and bonuses. There's a ton of additional cards in this game. And I mean, like, there's so many. There's, there's so much you can add to your deck. New unique equipment you can give to your character. Uh, additional attack cards for your deck. Additional damage that can be added to your damage deck. And so on and so forth. And each character has its own unique function. Like I said, my insectoid character is going to be able to kind of switch up his or her attacks whenever they flip over a new card on their turn. There's another character that allows you to attack with two separate weapons and you can kind of pick and choose between those cards so you get kind of two attack decks and a singular damage deck. Um, and so yeah, they all function kind of a little differently as well as all the monsters. And you go through the game and you play as many of them as you'd like. You can start a brand new fresh campaign if you'd like or progress on the same one with the same players and Play them like a one-shot or a full campaign. It's really up to you how you want to play this game. But yeah, a lot of stuff going on in this game. Let's cover my review. There's, I'm sure, a bunch of stuff I didn't cover in the game because there's a lot to talk about, but this will give you a good idea of how it's played. And that is Monster Hunter World Wild Spire Waste, the board game. Uh, and there is a lot of combinations to this game, but in general, in practice, you're fighting against a monster. There are four different characters with unique subtypes and ways you can customize it. Like, for instance, my... Insect Glaive uh, actually has a bone rod and an iron blade. I started with the iron blade. And you can, as you progress through the campaign, increase it with better weapons. A steel blade to a chrome blade or a bone rod to a flame kaffir to a gnashing flame naffer. Hopefully saying that right. But these will increase the value of your damage decks. Moving from a 7-3, which is 7 ones and 2 threes, to 2 ones. Two, uh, seven twos and three threes. And it just progresses from there to make it so that you can actually fight some of these more harder, hardened monsters. There are four unique monster figures. I showed you the biggest one here, Black Diabolos, because it's the coolest looking one, but there are unique um, like variations to the monsters as well, as well as their behavior decks, thusly making them more challenging. You won't fight this one first. You're gonna fight, uh, I believe it's this guy here you'll fight first in the game. Uh, but you can progress from there, and you can go from monster to monster, or fight them multiple times. And sometimes that's best, because you really want to improve your character before you go into the harder fights, because this game is definitely a challenging game. Uh, players, while they have a ton of variation, have some limitations as well based on their stamina. You'll feel like you're running out of stamina as you play this game. You're going to be only be able to rest a certain amount in the game, which is basically considered time. And so when you use these time cards and you flip them over, sometimes they'll let you remove more than one card, but most of the time it's just one card from your board. So applying a bunch of cards all at once can do a bunch of damage, but then you're kind of left with less spaces to be as useful to your team. Being able to move on the game board might feel like there's not a lot of movement, only one space, or if you want, instead of just doing your move and attack, you can actually do this kind of rest action where you can either uh, move or sprint, shuffle your discard deck into your deck, uh, redraw hand cards, kind of like resupply. And so you have kind of one of two options, but for the most part, you'll be simply moving a space, using your cards to fight the monster and doing damage based on where you are on the monster, based on how much armor that space has, and can you remove any of his little nodules here uh, to give yourself an even stronger benefit. This game 
feels just like the video game. It feels like you're hunting the monster, and after you hunt the monster, there's this big battle that ensues. Each of the campaigns kind of takes roughly about an hour, maybe an hour and a half to play, and you can come back and play again. You can save your progress. Each character is going to have unique items they'll gain from not only defeating the monster, but going throughout the kind of choose-your-own-adventure portion of the game. I love the idea of being able to add new and unique time cards to the deck, changing the variation of each of the fights, as well as the behavior of the monster. Kind of feels like the old Dark Souls game in terms of the bosses and how they interact with the players and how you can kind of, you know kind of what the monster is going to do. You can look at the card and be like, oh, this is like the talons here. And so when I flip it over, it's a left side bash. Um, or maybe I'm gonna look at something like the head here. And if I flip it over, it's a short charge. So you don't actually know what the monster is going to do, but you can kind of get a predetermination based on the back of the card. So you can kind of set up for that. And then after you've gone through the monster deck a few times, now you can start planning ahead. Okay, it's likely he's got these left attacks, which means that this is the next attack that could be possible, right? So if he did all his tail sweeps and there's the last tail, maybe the last tail is like a flail, a, a tail flail, in which case you can be like, okay, this is the next thing he's gonna do. Let's all move out of position here so that when he moves up to try and hit one of us and he swings, he's actually going to miss his attack. And so that can be very beneficial to the team um, being able to learn the monster's behaviors as well as players kind of setting up combos and not just dumping everything all at once, playing them at certain times to get as much power and variation as possible, trying to do as much damage to a certain particular part of a monster, removing it so that it can remove maybe its defenses, thusly do more damage to the HP of the monster and defeat it. The campaign aspect is cool as well. Being able to upgrade your character feels nice. The fact that each character has unique variations is great. All of that is wonderful about this game. There's a lot of cards in the game, uh, the miniatures. The miniatures are beautiful. They have great design. This is a Steamforge Games uh, creation, and I, I'm a big fan of their miniatures. Uh, the characters look and feel like Monster Hunter, and the monsters themselves look and feel like Monster Hunter as well. This is a Black Diabolos, and it looks great. The way it references how it attacks and how it moves is very simplistic and easy to learn quickly, which I like as well. A few negatives. We'll cover some negatives now. Uh, negative one is the game takes a bit to set up, especially for your first time. Each character has its own unique set of decks and cards. You'll have to go through all the cards and find each of the decks. Hopefully, after you play your first game, my strong recommendation is that you make sure that you set aside each of the card stacks for each of the players and keep track of your playing more than one campaign. You have to set up at a later date to kind of rubber band or baggy the cards so that you know which cards go where and what your upgrade cards are compared to your basic cards. So setup can be kind of a slog. Now table space is not so bad. Uh, obviously I'm showing you more than what is needed here. I kind of pushed a bunch to the side here, um, but it does look very intimidating. Uh, the other thing with this game is it's very challenging. Uh, it seems like it's a pretty straightforward game and it is, but being able to coordinate, learn behaviors, enact those uh, behaviors with your character's abilities and how you want to use your stamina board, it gets, you have to be intrinsic. You have to think about what your next deck is. Uh, who's going to be the next player to make an action? How many players making an action will change? So each behavior of each monster is going to function differently and make your turn feel different. Like, okay, you three need to go next and you need to do these three things. The next monster attack is a tail sweep. Only one player can act. So now that changes your whole strategy and you have to be willing to change on the fly with this game. It is all about micromanagement in this game, selecting characters, and making sure you make the best choices for movement and attacks. Uh, not every character is best against every monster, and so you have to make use of them as either supporting characters or aggressing characters, depending on what monster you're fighting and what area they're available to hit, because monsters can pack a little bit more of a punch, depending on where you're able to slam. If you can only slam the front of the monster and it's completely armored up, it's not gonna be an adequate way for you to be able to do damage to it. So instead, maybe you're gonna to wanna to make sure that you can try and taunt it next turn. Or if somebody else is close to death, you wanna try and drag that monster away. You'll notice that, oh, the next monster attack's probably gonna be the farthest away character. I'm just gonna to run to the back here so that this monster will fly over here, thusly evading attack from my ranged characters and hitting me, or at least attempting to hit me. And so there's all that going to the game. It's got that campaign scenario and all that good stuff all rolled into one, but there is, you know, a bit of complexity to the game. The last little thing I should say is the board's very minimalistic. I really kind of wish they added 
the rocks and um, the water and the trees to the game as opposed to these little uh, pieces here. It does give you enough to understand what spaces are where, so that's fine, not a big huge issue, but I would like to see a little bit more miniatures in the game. There are additional expansion packs that'll add new monsters and I believe characters as well, so you can add those to the game, but maybe you can make your own unique kind of portions to the game board to make it look even nicer, since it is just basically a six by six grid. Overall, Monster Hunter Worlds is an excellent game. This is a unique game where it's just a boss fighter, and so you're basically just going from boss to boss to boss, which is really cool. And for those of you looking for a game like that, there's not a lot out there that does that, that does it very well. Uh, in fact, playing the original Dark Souls, I know they made a remastered, which I'm looking forward to trying out because I didn't like the first Dark Souls. I thought it was too complicated and there's too many items that you couldn't use when you defeated monsters. This doesn't do that. All your monsters and characters are specified, your upgrades are specified, what you get is basically up to you. You have a lot of choice in this game and variation. Artwork, quality of the game, all that is all there in the game Monster Hunter World Wild Spire Race. It's a fun game. If you're a big fan of Monster Hunter and you're a board gamer, this is a game to pick up. I really enjoyed it. And if you've got two to three other friends that want to play it with you, you're going to really love it as well. Thank you guys for watching the Darn Filthy Gamer board game review for the game Monster Hunter World Wild Spire Waste. This is the core game, and there are additional content uh, pieces if you'd like to include them. You can also check out our videos here on YouTube. We make videos usually Monday through Thursday, Monday through Friday. We also do a live stream on Thursdays uh, that is on whatnot for at 5.30 p.m. PST, and our live stream is at 6.30 p.m. PST on Sundays. Thank you so much. Subscribe to the channel if you would like to. You can see more videos just like this one here. Hit that bell notification button and let us know what you think about the game Monster Hunter World Wild Spire Waste. All right, guys, that's all I got for you this time. My voice is out. I look forward to battling more monsters with you in Monster Hunter next time.